Um, the best part of the about the increase is makan. Yeah. I had a little bit of uh, running nose. Then Amu would come, you know, oh, with that, you know, whatever hurts. She had steam with chicken uh, in Fu Chao. I said, you know, this kind of thing. I don't know if I was asleep. I don't have to worry about being out of a job <laughs> because I don't get a salary to begin with. So that's a mood question. I felt very bad, you know. Because you are always in a mission. People need priests to be lovely. Not for the priest's sake, but because they are bridges. No person will cross an ugly bridge. I think ordaining priests was the greatest satisfaction to see a priest, um, a candidate for priesthood, having finished his formation, coming up, ready for ordination, then being ordained and ready for ministry. That was the best. Yeah. Freedom. <laughs> Strangely, it is the freedom. It is the, the, the sense of the fact that because you are always in a mission, that mission propels you to have a sense of not being attached to anything. Oh, I'm attached to tons of things, you know. Yeah, I'm attached to family, I'm attached to friends, I'm attached to my die-cast aeroplanes. But that, having said that, I'm also thinking about the freedom that the priesthood affords me. You know, freedom from, in a sense, a person, responsibility like for example a married family man you know, can you imagine the responsibility they need to have towards their to the spouse and to their children yeah we are you know i always tend to compare myself between a priest and a family man a married uh, husband and a father of kids i always you know i will always tilt my uh, that uh, what you call it um, you know take my head off to the family man because I imagine he has so much more responsibility that makes him uh, less selfish and more other-centered. Whereas for priests, the tendency is that we get, we get people listening to us and people think that whatever we say is the gospel truth. So it's not good for the ego and it really, unchecked, can build up into something that is really monstrous inside the, priest, inside the person. So what I really do, the best thing about being a priest, therefore, indeed is you know, I have the best of both worlds. I have an audience that will lis ready, lis uh, readily listen to me. You know, I have my job cut out for me, in a sense. I don't have to worry about being out of a job <laughs> because I don't get a salary to begin with, so that's a mood question. But more importantly, and if I have to say this rather seriously, uh, on a serious note, is this, yeah? being a Catholic priest, <clears throat> you can still live a life that is reasonably free like every other you know bachelor out there yeah you can put you can go for your sports you can enjoy a movie you can go in a mall you can get out of the castle and you can you know be in your civilian clothing and enjoy life now why do i say that is because when you think about what women religious have to put up with then you see the great contrast if you are a nun or a sister Oh my goodness, God help you if people see you in civilian clothing and shopping and, and watching a movie and you know buying a burger and eating an ice cream in the public, you know. There is definitely that inherent um, uh, inequality in the church. I recognize that. You know, it, it, it will be a long time for us to, to, to get to that space where male and females are recognized as equal in the church in that regard. Yeah, the, the liberal, uh, the freedom that is given to priests as compared to freedom that is given to women religious is so vastly different. Just, just think about this. Uh. If you see a priest with a mug of beer in his hand and even a cigarette in his hand, you're just like, oh, yeah, okay, you know, especially old priests. Now, change that to a nun and you can imagine the reaction. That, that for me, I appreciate that kind of uh, freedom that's given to me but it also comes with a lot of responsibility and a lot of self-awareness, which is why I think that's one power I need to have more and more. <laughs> um, the best part of being, about being priest is um, the friendship from people, the support from people. 
you know, I, and uh, I recall when I was just ordained, I was posted to Cebu. And you have, uh, I had a little bit of uh, running nose. Then Amu would come, you know, or oh, with that, you know, whatever herbs she had steamed with chicken uh, in Fuchao. You know, this kind of thing. So sometimes overdone, but the support, you, you feel great. People still, people love you. Yeah, people love you. And uh, also going back to my Cebu experience, that the time that I spent with the youngsters, that was really very good. I enjoyed every single day of it. Um, just elaborate on it. Eh? Uh, so there was uh, there were these youngsters. Some of them were students in Sacred Heart, Saint Elizabeth School. So Brabina to make sure that they would they, they would go to school to study. But then they would be let off at about nine or half nine. And behind the old Sacred Heart Church in Cebu, I made a prayer room, the sacristy part of it, I made a prayer room. You could see the Blessed Sacrament from the, in, from the back. So, nine, half past nine, we would gather together for charismatic prayer, then half an hour, then what? Then we would just walk across the road to the coffee shops opposite, and we would sit ourselves in one coffee shop, and we would chat and chat and chat. You know, now I look back, I said, I don't blame the parents of those kids who were with me there until midnight. This was very inconsiderate on my part. But uh, I shared this in my Silver Jubilee booklet, uh, um, Experience with the Youth. <clears throat> what was important is we chatted, we talked a lot of nonsensical things, <laughs> laughed a lot and enjoyed those. But in the midst of it, I also picked up problems that some of them were facing. And then, you know, when you come to, to talk to this person, you know there is this problem. At least you guess that it is there. So that has been a big, big uh, satisfaction, I would say. And okay, then <clears throat> I left them. Uh, and for many years, I didn't go back to Cebu. Then when I was made a bishop, when I was made a bishop, a few of them came from Cebu, those youngsters. Huh? Now they had children. So a few of them came and they said, Bishop, we will book your, your, your air ticket. And you just tell us when you can come. So I went. And I was surprised. They had 50 tables of these youngsters and I don't remember how many they were. With their wives, their husbands, their children, 50 tables. That was really moving. And one chap told me, I left the church for a long time. But how did I come back? I thought of Father Muren, who was in St. Mary's Cebu before, and I thought of you. So it was really good. Good to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> As bishop, um, I think ordaining priests was the greatest satisfaction to see a priest, um, a candidate for priesthood, having finished his formation, coming up, ready for ordination, then being ordained and ready for ministry. That was the best. Terbaik, apa yang saya suka lah sebagai seorang padri adalah saya dapat bersama-sama di dalam suka dan di dalam duka dalam kehidupan mereka yang di bawah pelayanan saya ya uh, walaupun kadang-kadang uh, ia cukup mencabar tetapi kepuasan itu adalah apabila mereka dapat melihat Tuhan ya dalam pelayanan uh, saya ini saya rasa itu yang cukup-cukup uh, memuaskan hati saya ya saya masih ingat lagi uh, di dalam satu program kaya masa itu saya betul-betul penat tetapi uh, terpaksa bukan terpaksa ya tapi saya di uh, uh, ditugaskan ya untuk menjaga seorang yang sakit peserta kaya yang sakit dan uh, dia baring saya pun baring di katil kami masing-masing dan dia bercerita tentang dirinya sendiri tapi <laughs> saya tidak sedar yang saya tertidur apabila saya bangun hari sudah siang Dan saya rasa betul-betul, um, alamak, I feel very bad, you know. Di sana orang yang menceritakan suka duka hidupnya, saya pula ternyenyak tidur. Mungkin uh, it became a lullaby for me. Uh, 
tetapi apa yang saya dapat lihat ya melalui um, program kaya sebenarnya bagaimana seseorang itu dapat berubah ya seorang yang cukup degil yang tidak melahu tidak mahu melakukan ini itu tetapi selepas proses pembentukan dia betul-betul berubah menjadi seorang yang betul-betul menjadi rasul Kristus ya dan itu memberi kepuasan sebab itu saya ya mahu ya bersama dengan uh, mereka yang di bawah pelayanan saya di dalam suka dan di dalam duka kerana di situlah Kristus hadir Kristus wujud ya di dalam kehidupan mereka di dalam kehidupan saya No not at all and that's a grace yeah seriously i mean that's the only time i can answer with fair conviction that i have no regrets yeah i do regret that i can't do a lot of other things that i would be able to do if i were not a priest like you know you don't have to ask permission to do uh, to do anything like take a vacation um now i don't even have vacations <laughs> yeah yeah everything i need to do needs a permission from a superior Um, I don't have that kind of uh, financial flexibility that I would have if I were a lay person. But you know, all these things I have come to see as being uh, superficial is one thing. But they are they are also not the most important thing. Yeah, there are little sacrifices that you can you can give up, and there's no regret in giving up all those things. So yeah, simple and the shortest answer to all the questions that have been asking: no regrets. <laughs> Puji Tuhan uh, setakat 4 tahun pelayanan saya. <laughs> Sedikit lagi mau tersasul 40 tahun belum lagi. <laughs> yes. Puji Tuhan um, 4 tahun pelayanan saya sebagai seorang padri tidak pernah sedetik pun saya merasa menyesal. Kerana uh, pada saya ya ini adalah kurnia Tuhan yang cukup bernilai kepada saya dan saya malah saya bersyukur di atas setiap detik pelayanan saya sebagai seorang padri. Um, again, just sharing an experience. When I was doing my doctorate, um, writing my thesis in Rome, I, I had a bargain with Jesus. <laughs> I said, look, I have so much of research to do. You will understand. I, you know, for, for us, uh, priests, we are encouraged to do what we call visits to the Blessed Sacrament every day. And uh, we are asked, we are advised, uh, do at least 15 minutes. Okay. So I kind of bargained with Jesus. I said, you understand, but once I finish my research and all, I come back. Uh, you know what? It didn't last long. I felt really bad and guilty. And then I said, okay, Lord, you have called me back. So I come back to you. So I spend time, more than 15 minutes, uh, every day before the Blessed Sacrament. And you know what? My concentration was much better. What I would need, like maybe three hours to do, I could do in within an hour. In that way, it was also very time-saving. So maybe that was the only time I could recall where I was disconnected. And deliberate, deliberately so. I, I mean, I bargained with Jesus, but uh, no. He brought me back. <laughs> He brought me back. I pray and uh, with the help of so many people that I continue to be a loving, a more loving, and yeah, why not a lovely priest? Not for my sake, not for my sake alone, but People need priests to be lovely. Not for the priest's sake, but because they are bridges. No person will cross an ugly bridge. A bridge that if I cross you, I might uh, fall under the bridge. So be a good bridge, then I will cross you. I hope I become that. Not just for my sake, for the sake of God's people and ab- above all of course for for God's sake closing thoughts to the people who are watching uh, this series i would say i go back to my experience don't be calculative with god 
when you feel he's calling you, maybe I should use the same term, bodo bodo you ikut. <laughs> you will find the Lord leading you to green pastures. That's my closing word to all of you who are listening in. So this is Father Elvin Ng. Saya Father Galvin Richard Ngumba. This is Father Ramon, a Salesian missionary priest. This is Archbishop Emeritus John Ha. Thank, Thank you everyone for joining, joining us in Spilling, Spilling the Day. Thank you. God bless. <laughs>